The Drink Beer, Think Beer podcast is sponsored by Beer Edge. I'm Andy Crouch, the co-founder of Beer Edge, along with my partner and your podcast host, John Hall. John and I work hard to bring you fresh and insightful content related to the ever-changing world of craft beer. We're passionate about beer and independent journalism. If you're interested in supporting Beer Edge, visit our website, beeredge.com, which is updated regularly with new content, interviews, and articles. Please also consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your episodes. You can also subscribe to the Beer Edge newsletter on our website. Is there anyone you think that we should be talking to? Please drop us a line at andy at beeredge.com with your thoughts. And as always, thanks for your support. Welcome to Drink Beer, Think Beer, the podcast that gets to the bottom of every pint. I'm John Hall, and this is a fun episode. For the first time since the pandemic started, I had the chance to do a one-on-one in-person interview with a brewer. It happened just a few days ago in my backyard in suburban New Jersey, and across the patio table from me was Ethan Cox, the co-founder and president of Community Beer Works in Buffalo. I'll tell you all about it in just a moment, but first, I'm happy to tell you that this episode is produced by Beer Edge. Check out BeerEdge.com for articles, podcasts, and to subscribe to the newsletter written by myself and Andy Crouch. And also be sure to follow Beer Edge on social media at The Beer Edge. So people say it's a small world, and that's absolutely true. If you listen to the show, I always give people an opportunity to have an impact on the content. And before COVID-19 sent us all into lockdown, I received an email from a listener who encouraged me to have Ethan Cox on the show. Alex wrote in saying, quote, Ethan is a big part of craft beer culture here in Buffalo and helped take a plucky little nano brewery and turn it into a place that represents the neighborhood and the city that is very much a hidden gem, end quote. And so I did some digging. And I found out that Ethan is also a tireless advocate for New York beer and the efforts that its guild is pushing to make it easier for breweries to do business. He's also the co-author of Buffalo Beer, the history of brewing in the Nickel City, published by History Press. And it turns out his sister and I live in the same small town. So when the pandemic prevented us from getting together at since canceled beer events, Ethan made the trip down to Jersey ostensibly to see his sister but still managed to sneak away, douse himself in sanitizer, and share some beers in the backyard. We opened up some barley wine from his cellar, and I made my way through several of his beers as well. We'll talk about all of those as the show progresses. But intrigued by the name of the brewery, that's where I started with him, asking what, in his opinion, the beer community is like these days. Here's our conversation. Well, you know, we've always, I think we've always thought that um, community is something that occurs on a lot of different levels or like you can think of concentric circles of community. So the innermost community is literally ourselves and, you know, our employees and, and, and owners and, and our, uh, our, our fans. Um, we, we want to tend to that community, of course. Um, and I think the next level out would be, you know, the community that we live in. We are very proud Buffalonians. I mean, you won't, you won't meet too many Buffalonians who aren't, um, there was a time there when everybody was fleeing Buffalo, but it's, it's really been coming back for the last, you know, a couple of decades in, in a lot of ways. And so, and you can't, even people who leave Buffalo are still obsessed with Buffalo. Um, you just can't get it out of them. So, you know, that community was important to us when we started this brewery. There was literally only one other craft brewery in Buffalo, Flying Bison, and they'd been around for a while. Yeah. Um, and we were the next brewery to open after them. Um, so they opened in 2000 and we opened in, in 2012. Wow. But, um, so that community in not, the modern age, at least. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I can, well, cause we can you have talk, a whole can, book, can, you have a whole book can on talk about all the other wrote, breweries. Yeah. Sure. Um, and then, and then of course the, the biggest community of all in some respects is the community of the, of the brewing industry. I mean, this is a great industry in that everybody is very approachable and friendly and, you know, it's very much a big tent. And, uh, and so, you know, that community is another one that we are, I think, responsive to and of. There, there's a, a general thought, though, and it, it has been changing, I think, in the last couple of years, at least, where it used to be, you know, breweries were 
not getting into social issues. They mm. weren't necessarily talking about what was happening outside of their doors. It was, hey, sure. come inside, have an IPA, come inside, uh, escape the world kind of thing. Sort of treating it like a bar where you know we yeah. didn't talk about you know sex, politics, religion, and everything. And I've said this yep. before on the show. Um, but your brewery has taken public stances on what's happening in the world right now. And a couple of weeks ago, Buffalo was the center of uh, some of the Black Lives Matter protests. There's yep. a, a terrible video that was shared of mm-hmm. the local police department uh, injuring an a, a, a older man. Yep. Um, you know, and, and you didn't hold back on that. And mm. the brewery didn't hold back on that. And I'm curious as to uh, how you approach, you know, blending you know, what's happening in the world with with the brewery because you're the president of a brewery. You have to worry about the bottom line on some level. Yeah. Um, when, do, when do you stop caring about, you know, money and just stand up and do what's right? Yeah. Well, or, that, or do they have to go hand in hand? It's a delicate balance is, I guess, a better <laughs> way to put it, right? Sure. Um, and, yeah, so, I mean, one way of answering that is to say that this is the company that we have to be because these are the people we are. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not really optional, um, for us to, um, to profess, you know, what, what we think is right and to, to, to champion the causes that we think need, need championing and and to, to shine a light on things. Um, I just, I'm going to use we more than anything else in this interview because yeah. we're, we're really a team, but I'll, I'll go ahead and just speak for well, myself that's the, on that, this that one. That speaks in with the community theme. It's, there's right. no I in community. There's not. No, yeah. No, it's a Y. <laughs> yeah. You can spell it with an I if you want to be clever there. If like, you're a millennial, you spell it, <laughs> correct, yeah, you right. spell your name with an I. Right. Yeah. Um, no, there is an I in it. U-N-I-T-Y. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so there is. So, sure. Good. But How anyway, many writers does it take to, yeah. <laughs> right. Great. But but what I will say is that, you know, I mean, um, it's not, I, I have reflected on the fact that I think by making our um, our stance, you know, evident and, and literally baking it into the name of the brewery, I, I don't think it has always served us well. I do think that there are people who shy away from that, who want what you described. They want just a brewery to be about beer. And if a brewery is about other stuff, they, they're not... They're not happy about that. When, when you say that there's been times where it hasn't served you well, what's an example of that? Well, I, I can't I, I can't say for sure that there are people that do not want to buy us because of our our evident stance on things. But I but you have I can DMs tell you peripherally that, probably, that yeah, yeah I mean like it, it it's it's definitely been the case. Um, has that been since the beginning, or has that ramped up in the last couple of months? Um. It hasn't ramped up in the last couple of months. It's ramped up as we have grown and uh, and 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 gotten bigger and wider exposure. So when we were just a nano brewery on the west side of Buffalo, um, our demographic was totally on board, and we weren't trying to reach any further because we couldn't even make enough beer for them, right? But as we've scaled up, you know, now we're trying to reach into the the suburbs of Buffalo, and the suburbs of Buffalo are like the suburbs of whatever city you want to talk about. It's sure they're not. They're politically closer to neutral than anything else and uh, or worse. So, you yeah. know, I right. So I know that it, it, it may sometimes be a liability, but I will I would say that a uh, I think I already said we, we really can't be some other brewery. This is us. And B, you know, the world is changing. And I and I think more and more customers are demanding that of the products that they buy and the companies they buy them from. So, you know, maybe, maybe it will get caught up with <laughs> in that respect. I don't know. I mean, I, that, that, that's such an interesting thing, though, because there is still choice in beer. And we do think about, you know, local. But when you're talking about being the second one that came in, that, that opened up in Buffalo, I mean, before that, right? I mean, Genesee in Rochester probably uh, was, was a dominant player in your mm-hmm. in your city. Uh, your proximity to Canada, I imagine that there was it was a big Labatt town. Blue Blue is considered a local beer, right? Yeah. So how do you when you're sort of thinking about you know local products now? It's not like you know some other towns where it's not like St. Louis and some of the uh, where Budweiser was so ingrained or you know Milwaukee where Mil- I, I feel like some yeah. of those brewers Randy Sprecher in, in, in Milwaukee had uh, a bigger battle to, to, to fight or a different battle to, mm-hmm. to, to fight early on 
Um, is there is there actually a renewed focus on 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 local and can can you see it where you used to have you know as you're calling it blue but labat drinkers um you know i know that's like the local term yeah, i know blue, it's, it's uh, me. um uh but, and blue light yeah <laughs> Uh, I had a friend who uh, is still have a friend who grew up in uh, Lockport who uh, yeah. that's all she drank yep. and uh, at her wedding it was the only beer option uh, and I that, was that sounds actually it sounds entirely wonderful to me <laughs> I mean <laughs> yes but, but is there ha, ha, how do you promote local in a town where there's so many other breweries from outside of town mm -hmm. that were so popular yeah, that, it's been a challenge. So, you know, I think one of the reasons that another craft brewery didn't open between Flying Bison in 2000 and us in 2012 uh, was the grip on, on Buffalo, that blue, and, and, and Budweiser. Is, this is one of the few markets where they're the second best-selling beer, but they are. Yeah. Uh, but they, they really had a grip on the town. And, and keep in mind as well, Buffalo is very much a industrial or post-industrial, I guess, uh, working-class kind of town. Mm -hmm. So paying a lot of money in fancy beers you know imports was about as far as that ever used to go or right. like Michelob dark you know because uh, pretty sexy bottle uh, the Bach yeah. yeah we all remember that yeah I but, think Mitch Steele like created those oh really yeah nice um so I I think it was it, I think it was for a while an uphill battle and I, I actually think that um for the for the decade plus that Flying Bison operated all by themselves, they would have loved for somebody else to open a brewery so that they could get the message out there. Um, but things changed over time uh, nationally, and so eventually also in Buffalo, we tend to be behind the curve. And, you know, I refer back to something I said earlier. Buffalonians really are into Buffalo. Okay. You, you, you really can't get it out of them. So they'll, they'll move to other markets and then they'll still import Weber's mustard and, you know, Chavetta's uh, barbecue sauce and like the various. You're like, saying these brands. I have no idea what they yeah, are. These are these are our local, you know, our local brands that really, you guys have a local mustard. Yeah. Oh, ah. I should have brought you Weber's. Okay. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I had no Next idea time. that that was such a thing. It can be done. <laughs> um, so. So I think that I think that, you know, once we started to have some momentum in our local industry, people started to be interested in it because it was local. Yeah. And and that gave them the chance to be adventuresome and start drinking different kinds of beers. So you couldn't sell it on on people just because, hey, this is a different beer than blue. But you could say, hey, we're we're a local we're a local brewery trying to get by. You know, so you want to support us. And, yeah, we make something really light, but why don't you try our IPA? Why don't you try our Hefeweizen? Something that can be a, a, a bridge to, you know, a barley wine someday or whatever. I mean, and, and we are drinking a 2018 Bigfoot that you brought, so yeah, thank you very cheers. much. And uh, but, but that's such an interesting thing, though, because that was the conversation that most towns or other regions were having in... 1990 mm. of yeah. you know yeah we make a Blondale but yep. we also make a Hefeweizen we also make a a, a a thing like that you started off as a nano you've obviously grown quite a bit mm -hmm. uh, in, in in the decade or so the eight or nine years that that you've been open I mean and and sort of tremendous growth with you're in a lot of accounts now you have a bigger brew yeah. house you're not brewing on a nano system to no, survive th thankfully oh my god yeah but how, how did you approach recipes early on um to get the ha, what did you say the buffalonians is that Bu yeah buffalonians buffalonians yeah. uh into the door to begin with because it's one thing like okay like yeah we're a local thing yeah we'll give it a shot like we won't drink labat for mm -hmm. you know this hour that we're here and then we'll immediately go back to our regularly scheduled program right. how do you get them to come in the first time but then come back again and again and again yeah. and again and again what, what was your approach recipe wise uh, well we were we were in a pretty good position by 2012 uh because you know flying bison had paved the way a little bit and gotten past the whole we have a light an amber and a dark you yeah. know phase of craft sure. beer that's they had to exist in that time which was the 1990 model right yeah by the time we we came along uh pallets were a little bit um more uh broadly experienced and you know the mores had shifted and and social media was starting to be a thing so people could get information about beer all by themselves and they started coming to us saying like we want we want you to make this we want you to make that 
And we were like, wow, I didn't think anybody would want to drink those, but that's great because we, we were all home brewers prior. Yeah. And so we were adventuresome drinkers and adventuresome brewers, and, and we were gratified that there was not just a, an audience for it, but that audience was actually demanding um, that, we, that we innovate and start you know, doing stuff. I mean, there, there were people who even said when we opened a Fly and Bison, oh, that's old man beer. I'm like, what? <laughs> what sure but i mean yeah i mean now they've of course you know continued to change and develop and they're they're doing you know new england ipas and kettle sours and stuff now too right yeah but when when we opened that was available to us because we were on a very small system for one thing so it was fairly low risk uh we could finish a batch ourselves if nobody else wanted to drink it (laughs) you know what i mean not a problem i I imagine you did in some of those early days it may have ever happened uh especially yeah Early on. So um, so I think the answer is that, you know, we, we were we were really lucky that we we started the company at the time when people were actually uh, a- educating themselves already and coming in to us and saying, well, we know this brewery probably isn't going to make this, but I bet you guys would. And, and hence we made an Adam beer. Hence we made a Czech dark lager, you know, hence we started doing kettle sours. We were the first brewery in Buffalo to do them. So. Yeah. Well, when there's two of you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's just a, yeah, it's a coin toss. But um, but did you also and I imagine even still to this day, though, um, it's a generational thing. And I see this 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 all the time. Like when I first started going to breweries and I would bring my dad along with me uh, or my dad would drive me because uh, I was young. Yeah. Um, you know, my dad would ask for something like a Guinness or a Heineken or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Um, you must still have people who come in and say, can I have a blue? And yeah, what do you got that's like blue? Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. go pills. And that's and that's what I'm drinking right now. Correct. Which, which I actually, I was reading the can uh, as I cracked this and speaking of community. So um, uh, you give a portion of the sales of this beer to a local project. Uh, that encourages uh, reading by younger people. And, yeah, and, yeah and, foundation and, and, and that yeah. foundation is actually run by an ex-Buffalo Bills player, Andre Reed. So everybody oh, okay. in Buffalo knows uh, that guy. He was part of the team when the team was any good. <laughs> you may remember back in the 90s. Well, you're down in the part of uh, the New York region right now where we're just full of disappointment in the NFL. So it's... Uh, <sighs> yeah. Yeah, our, our current bright spot is that the Toronto Blue Jays are playing in our stadium for however many games before Major League Baseball actually has to pack it in again. It's, we're days away. I we are, we are days away. I can't imagine we aren't. At this point. By the um, time this airs, we'll know. Uh, but so, so you point them to this, and sure. what was the design around it? So this is a blue can. It's a it's a different shade of Labatt. It's, uh, were, were there... It's not meant to compete with blue in terms of design. Your, your attorney is going to censor this before it runs, but it's like, yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's it it was really more. There is no similarity between a multinational it conglomerate just, and it's just yeah. not. Um, <laughs> our our brand manager uh, Chris Groves is a is a brilliant designer. He does all of our can design. He does a lot of our marketing design. And for this one, we wanted something that looked a little different from our beers because this is meant to appeal. A little bit more widely this may or may not be a craft beer even though we are a craft brewery but like that has a lot of rice that has a lot of um uh uh adjunct broadly speaking okay. i think we we hit it with a little amylase to make sure it's very very dry um we're not afraid of doing that because that's what you have to do to make a beer that tastes like that how does this beer sell in comparison to others in your portfolio it well it it has a little bit of seasonal variation because it's also a little bit tied to the sports okay so let's go bills is the is the oh i get it the the cry de cour okay so let's go pills okay yeah see i didn't even pick up on that so yeah that's okay okay. um buffalo is is steeped in its sports legacy It's, it's it's inescapable um, so that is, you know, directly supposed to tie into and, you know, hit the sports person in the fields there, right? 100%. Okay. So August through mid-February. It does better yeah. when football is on and it does a little bit okay while hockey's on and we don't have a major league baseball team of our own. So that's a different story. But, okay. um, yeah, so that, that, you know, that's why, but it, it also is the answer to the question. What have you got? That's like blue. We used to point people to our cream ale. Yeah. Close, but no cigar sometimes. I mean, most people accepted a cream ale as a substitute. For sure. Blue, for one or two. Better. 
Yeah. But then would still go and pick up a six pack on their way home. Right. right. Yeah. So we wanted to make sure that we, we covered the spectrum of, of beers that people want to drink. And, uh, you know, if, if there's a day that this sells like, like blue, that would be pretty cool. Although I can't imagine brewing it in 6,000 barrel batches. But there you go. You're not shy about saying that there's adjuncts in this, that this is, you know, modeled off of the American light lager that, you know, millions know and yeah. love. I feel like if we had had this conversation a decade ago, that that type of thing would have been skirted around by most brewers. Or we just wouldn't be doing it at all. Sure. We would have been unwilling to do it. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. I mean, and but there's, uh, there wasn't anything wrong with it back then. But there is this sort of, you know, thought about, I, I think it was Chris Loring at Notch who made a beer uh, that was an American adjunct lager, uh, and he called it the mule, um, <laughs> yes. you know, just cause they, you know, it kicks, all, you know, you get kicked for, for, for doing it. Uh, I'm butchering <laughs> that story probably, but, um, it's a necessary part of growing a brewery these days, right? And uh, going from a nano and scaling up ha- uh, how you have, I mean, I, I've said this before on the show. 13% of overall beer drinkers in the U.S. are still craft right now. I haven't seen the 2020 numbers yet, but, right. like, 13 is not a lot. It's just not. And you need to appeal to the other 87. Yeah. I mean, money needs to be made. Yeah. And we make money making beer. So, you know, there's always a struggle between making the beers that you want to drink and that you wish everybody would buy enough to, to keep you afloat and, you know, the knowledge that, well... Maybe there are some beers that you need to make because people want them and they'll buy them, whether or not they thrill you. Now, I'll tell you that we all enjoy drinking Let's Go Pills, so it's yeah. not as if we're, we're, we, we disdain this product. Yeah, you're not holding your nose and brewing. Oh, hell no. I mean, I think you know that a lot of brewers actually, at the end of the day, like to kick back with some sort of, you know, Miller High Life or yeah, whatever. Yeah, Coors like, Banquet. Yeah, yeah people, pe- people are more and more willing to admit that, actually. And, I mean, that reflects what we were just talking about, uh, the evolution. But... We yeah so and our head brewer uh, Ryan um, had experience at Kingfisher right and so he knows exactly how to make a light ricey corny lager beer and brought that experience with him to us and and we've benefited greatly from that. What's the beer in your lineup? Uh, you guys make a, a lot of different beers uh, regularly, seasonally. What do you reach for? Like, what's your in-house favorite? Uh, well. When we have it, it's uh, such an unfair it's question. Terrible question. It's a, it's a terrible I'm gonna, question. Because I'm going to give you five answers. Sure, great. That's fine. Conditional yeah. answers. Uh, I I should point out that I love asking this question. I also hate ask, uh, being asked this question, as, which as, I get all the time. Oh, you write about beer. You what's can, your you, What's your you favorite beer? You can always beer? go with the cop out. My favorite beer is the one I'm drinking it's, right now. Yeah, yeah. it's sure. uh, yeah. That's a fair uh, fair response. Um, <laughs> our 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 flagship pale ale is called Frank. And when we have Frank available, that's probably the thing I reach for the most. Um, that's Why? Nice. Uh, it's, a, it's an old school balanced pale ale um, like they used to make them or actually in some cases still do. So thanks Sierra Nevada. I oh, mean, sure. That's, that's, that's the ultimate pale ale model. And while this is not hopped with Cascade or uh, it's Cascade, right? It is, it is not. It does not yeah. emulate we don't use whole cone hops exclusively and we don't, yeah, it's Cascade. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a different beer, but it's got some malt, you know, which seems to not be very fashionable anymore. If you can taste any malt, what's wrong with this beer? Um, right. And, uh, and it has hops in, in, I think we're going to come back around to that. We, we may well, um, it's got hops in decent measure, but it's not like, you know, super bitter. Um, uh, we're really trying to drive a little flavor and aroma in there and just have a nice balanced pale ale and it comes in right five, I think four and a half for five. And, and that's just super drinkable. So that's why Frank, um, but you had other answers as well though. Sure. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm very fond of, I, I think I brought one or two, uh, the whale, which is our brown ale yeah. because it surprises people so much. I had that recently oh, thanks. and, uh, yeah, I really dug it. Uh, there, there's something just about a nice brown ale that just... <laughs> Especially this time of year. So we're sitting here in the backyard right now. Uh, the grill is covered, but normally um, I think a brown ale just goes so well with you know, grilled food in the middle of the summer. Oh, so you, yeah, that's my yeah. line, right? I People are like, I like darker beers, but I'm not sure if I want one in July. I'm like, do you like grilled food? And they're yeah, of course. I'm like, okay. So maybe you don't want to session out on a brown ale in July. That's fine. But yeah. when you pull that stuff off the grill, whether it's vegetables or meat, 
It's got Maillard reaction. It's going to resonate with the Maillard reaction in the dark malt. Yeah. You're going to find this is a beautiful pairing. And every time. There it is. Yeah. Um, you talked about balance, though, with the pale ale. And the thing that I was struck about, So, uh, and, and I'll put this in the intro to the, uh, uh, to the, to the episode uh, bef- before it goes out, but uh, your sister lives in town. Mm-hmm. Uh, and dropped off some beer a couple of weeks ago, maybe uh, uh, two months or so ago, and it was a variety of, of, of stuff from you. And I, and I, you know, anytime somebody takes the time to drop something off on the front porch, like I'm, I'm, I'm going to drink it. I'm excited to drink it. And the thing that I was struck about was, and you said the word balance, but I'm, I'm almost going to use the word restraint because mm-hmm. a lot of the beer that comes in for magazine reviews for you know, w- whatever. Um, if it says on the can, you know, X fruit, 99% of the time these days, I'm expecting to just drink puree yeah. that tastes like it. And yeah. the thing that really sort of stop and, 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 and hit me in a fun way with your beers is that there is a lot of restraint in there and I had to hunt for it just mm-hmm. a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I try to drink stuff blind and a lot of the time it's like, Oh, what is that? And let me think about that and let me walk away and come back and, and, sure. and, and try again. And before we started recording today, I had your lemongrass cream ale, um, which, you know, lemongrass is a very assertive herb. Like it is not nope. for the faint of heart. And anybody who's had Thai food, Thai food unfortunately right. yeah. gotten like, you know, the bite of it, mm-hmm. uh, that's all you're going to taste for the next four days. Yeah. Uh, this is not that. So no. is that... A Buffalonian thing? Is that a you know Ethan thing? Is that a community <laughs> thing? Like what? To to not necessarily, you know, take the uh, the huge wiffle ball bat and hit you on the side of the head <laughs> with it. Like what's the? Um, I mean, the most direct answer there is that our good because our... that was a meandering question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, as as happens sometimes. Um, our, our R&D brewer is a guy named Robert uh, Turley. He's been with us since almost the very beginning. And he's the guy with the deft touch. He is the guy who does not like to be heavy-handed with stuff. Um, and he's, he's, a very, he's a very thoughtful human, and he's a very thoughtful brewer. And when he, when he starts doing recipe design, um, he's always approaching it with, I want, I want, a certain amount of complexity and also subtlety. And we don't really like to hit people over the head with anything. That's true. And that's, that's the collective will of CBW. So in some sense, Robert's just, you know, sort of um, manifesting what we all kind of think. Yeah. Like we all also really like pretty dry beer. So that, that means the puree can bombs are not on our, on our to-do list because we would, like I said, we, you have to find a balance between stuff you actually want to drink and stuff that'll sell. Yeah. I suppose we should probably be making beers like that if we want to sell more beer, but I don't think anybody would believe us or buy it. You know what I mean? Like, cause that's not what we do. Um, so let the other breweries that are younger than us and are doing the pastry stouts and are doing the, you know, fruity puree, uh, type beers and stuff like let them do that. That's their wheelhouse, and that's, I guess, what they want to do. Yeah. And we, we really don't. Now, that's not to say that we haven't ever done. We've, we've done a pastry stoutish kind of thing. But, like, sure. when we put it out there, the geeks were like, twice as much lactose. And we were like, yeah, right. No. Never, okay. <laughs> there you go. But that's what we didn't do. We didn't do twice as much lactose. Like, yeah. we just couldn't do it. So. Does that pay dividends in the long run, do you think, though? I think. I, I, I hope so. <laughs> I, I, I mean, so. you talk about flying bison as being like, you know, like, you know, the old man beer, or, you know, the father's beer or, or stuff like that. I, like, I did not that, say that, Tim. OK, well, it, there is some sort of, you know. <laughs> yes, I know. No, somebody said that. Wasn't yeah. Me. Yeah. Right. You were relaying a I was story relaying about. A story. Yes. Correct. OK. Um, <laughs> but is there a worry, though, if because I, I, when I talk to younger brewers, folks who are into it right now. Uh, and in the thick of it or just opening up right now, I mean, it, it's they're not necessarily stopping and thinking about like, well, what do I want to do? They're they're saying, OK, like, what is the market and therefore the nerds, the geeks, the the whatever demanding? Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I guess it's it's a double edged sword, right? It's 
if you only follow those trends, at some point you might be left behind when the trends shift. But if you're also not paying attention or doing them as they're happening, you know, you're also then irrelevant. Or I, you're I, leaving I money on the table sure. at, at the worst or best, I suppose. Um, yeah, no, it's a tough balance, you know, and it, it stings a little bit sometimes that, you know, I know that even if we put... Uh, you know, pounds and pounds and pounds of puree into a beer, it probably wouldn't sell like some other breweries that do that all the time because we're not known for that. Yeah. And nobody's going to nobody's gonna think that that was convincing. They're going to think we were just, you know, doing that because we needed to do that. So I think it's, it's, it's tough. Um, but, you know, tr tr trends and styles ebb and flow and kind of come and go. And I think that we, we can do such a wide variety of beers that whatever the future brings... I think we'll be we'll be fairly well set for it. Without saying lager, what is a trend in beer that you would like to see happen? <laughs> Without saying lager, I mean, isn't lager finally a trend? It, After it all is. these years, at, have we have we not made it a trend? By Ash, Ashley Carter from Beerstadt likes to say that lager is on a hundred and fifty year winning streak right now. <laughs> Um, well, but on like, a certain level, it's not a trend at all, right? It's the beer that most of the world drinks. Right. Most so of the that's time. why I'm saying, like, sure. not lager. Um, uh, what would I like to see more of again? Um, me personally, yeah. Uh, I, 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 I miss, I miss the barley wines, stronger, maltier beers. Yes, okay. barley wines, a Dom beer, um, Alex which, which I think got a of as like that German. He wants you to check out. But oh, yeah. cool. That's I think like, of that as like German <laughs> barley wine. Um, I like American barley wines more than English barley wines, to be fair. Uh, so they, triple IPAs that have aged? Triple IPAs that have aged fair. <laughs> well played, <laughs> sir. Well played. Um, Augie Carton's going to hit me up for a check now for saying that. But yeah, that's nice. fine. But I realize that there's not ever going to be like tons more of those beers because they just don't have the crushability that you, know, that, that you need to sell things in volume that get you, you know, kind of money. So... Like some of the things I'd like to see more of, there are market forces, not just cultural or preferential forces that keep them a little bit at bay. The interesting thing, though, it, it, you're right about the marketability. Like it's a, it's a, it's a tough sell, and I think that's why a lot of people either sell single bottles or four packs of it as opposed to to six. And this is the eighteen Bigfoot from Sierra that we're that we're drinking right now, and just a simple twelve ounce heritage bottle. But yeah. Um, Delicious too. Wonderful what what age. I'm realizing is this is the first interview in person that I have done since early March, <laughs> and what I'm thoroughly enjoying about this experience with you right now is that there's a bottle on the table along with the hand sanitizer and everything else, but we each have a glass and we're just sort of pouring back and forth from the same bottle into a glass, and it's a beer that facilitates conversation. One hundred percent. And I almost think like there's the marketing for post COVID of like, let's crack open the beers that matter when we can again, you know, as opposed to like, you know, this can collection that I have of yours, uh, <laughs> that's building on my side of the table right now of, uh, you know, beers that are, that are fun to drink in an afternoon, but there's beers that facilitate a conversation. And this is, this is kind of one of them. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, and I think that that's one of the things that I love about beer is the way it, it creates community. I mean, you know, that sounds like a little self-serving, sorry, but you know, no. that's when you think about third spaces, which is a sociological term. Yeah. Uh, have you talked about this before? I, I, no, but I know what it is, but, but, but well, unpack it. Yeah. I'll unpack it real quick. Um, from sociology. Um, the idea is that, you know, the, the first space or the first room, I think they're kind of used interchangeably is your, is your home. That's where you, that's where you sleep at night, presumably and wake up in the morning. Um, not necessarily every night or every morning, but, um, the second space is work. I mean, it used to be different for me in the, these days. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. I haven't um, left this backyard in five months. Oh man, man. Uh, I feel, um, but the second one, the second space is work. Cause you spend, you know, the next most amount of your life there basically. Yeah. The third space though, is the place where, where, where you truly, where you truly, exchange news and views and you interact and you meet people you don't already know. Um, and there's a lot of things that function as third spaces uh, besides bars or brewery tap rooms. Uh, you can cite uh, barber shops or beauty, you know, beauty salons. You can say coffee shops, right? Yeah. But I think, I think even more, uh, I, 
I think the role that beer plays in that third space is super facilitatory. Now, of course, you know, sometimes people get a little bit riled up and get into, let's say, you know, they have words, but for the most part, beer, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but for the most, <laughs> polite. polite, yeah. Um, but for the most part, I think beer opens opens up conversation, and that's one of my favorite things about it. And it's because it, it usually comes in at a comfortable ABV. So, of course, this one's a little bit on the stronger side. But, you know, most beers, the vast majority of beers are not at wine level, and they're certainly not at spirit level. Yeah. And uh, and I think that that, that sessionability um, is, is really facilitatory in terms of, of what a third space is really all about. So that's one of the reasons I just love beer. We we're talking about uh, how we got onto all of this is you know post COVID and, sh- and and sharing um, sharing beers. Whenever we come out of this, the beer world is going to be fundamentally changed, and we're 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 seeing closures. We're seeing uh, people who who are really in dire straits right now. But 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 more than that, on the um, the inter level of beer, we've seen the national brewers association change. Uh, they let a lot of people go, including their state guild coordinator, yeah. uh, the head of the AHA, the American home brewers association, yep. Julia hers got let go. She's on yeah, uh, Andy's Julia, podcast Gary, this week. Acacia. Yeah. Julia. I mean, it, it, there, there's a lot of people who have been, um, influential to helping breweries promote themselves or helping home brewers get to the next stage. Um, that maybe the the general beer drinker isn't aware of. Um, And when we come out of this, they likely won't be around. And the the guild itself, which is focusing on Capitol Hill efforts uh, for for taxation and some other things, um, is going to be focused on whatever it's going to be focused on. A lot of the change for good that is going to happen for beer is going to happen on the local level. And mm-hmm. you're involved in the New York state brewers guild, yep. which has done uh, a lot of work on behalf of the, I, gosh, it's like 300 like plus members we, these days. We are, right? we are uh, well, membership is different from the number I'm of sorry. breweries sad, but true, but um, yeah. we're up at, we're, we're over 460 breweries in New York state. Okay. So we now have the second most breweries of any state and we're never next to California. California. Yeah, no, California is yeah. a thousand plus. When you think about the change that needs to come to the brewing industry to help consumers relate to uh, how to help the industry grow, we were talking about the 13 percent and everything. Right, that change has to happen on a state level uh, with legislation mm-hmm. and education and all of that. Um, whereas I think we might have looked nationally in the past, post COVID, it really is going to have to be on a state by state level. Yeah. Um, where is New York now? Where should New York be? Well, New York is in is in pretty good shape, uh, generally speaking. We we have a very, um, I'm going to say, well developed uh, guild at this point. Yeah. Um, so we and your able, executive director is great. Paul's yeah, we awesome. we were yeah. able to hire Paul Leone uh, pretty early on. Um, I think almost uh, it's, it's got to be like seven, six to seven years ago. Yeah. Um, and he's proven he's proven to be uh, not just uh, a remarkably awesome guy but a, a very effective executive director. And he is, he is unwavering um, in, his, in his fervent support for our industry. I mean, so much so that he's, anytime he sees another guild outperforming us in some way, shape, or form, he gets, he gets <laughs> viscerally upset. Um, which, you know, I mean, I, that's, that's kind of what you want in an executive director, right? Yeah. Um, and Tenacity. Our, it is, yeah. yeah. Whew, he's tenacious, that's right. Um, and our board, you know, uh, is, is, is also equally, you know, in, intelligent and thoughtful. And we try to take the time. We, we have meetings. We meet every, once a month, every month, except in August. Um, so this is our bi month. Um, and we, we, we really think about all the different issues that need to be thought about, and including responding to, you know, what, what are we forgetting? What are breweries yeah. telling us? For, for the most recent, you know, the pandemic, um, you know, we sprung into action and we were able to get the state government to give us an, an awful lot of capabilities temporarily. And some of them we would like to retain now that we have them. Yeah. Um, that have that have made it a lot easier for breweries to get by uh, while things were pretty tough. So I think we've done a good job. But like, what is the future like? I mean, 
my my concern is that of the 460 plus breweries, a lot of them, and I mean to a certain extent ourselves included, but a lot of them were very much that tap room model. Yeah, where the tap room is bringing in 60, 70, maybe 80 or 90 percent of your revenue. That's what's going to be really difficult because if you've got a canning line and you are just a, a manufacturer. You're okay. You've got distribution. You're in the grocery stores, the C stores, the gas stations where beer is bought uh, for on off premise. But um, if you depended on on premise, and if you depended on your own on premise specifically, then you're in you're in you're in a bad position. And there's not a lot that the guild can really do about that. I mean, that's that's the economics of the hospitality industry writ writ large and yeah. restaurants and bars are, are, are in, are in as dire a shape as every brewery tap room. Where does the consumer come in at this point to, you know, you're, you're talking about a growing consumer base. You're talking about people who are thinking about local again. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not coming from across an international border, not coming from another major New York city. Um, yeah. In New York, but also I, I think generally, um, consumers don't always think about community. They don't always think about, um, you know, the overall business of, uh, of, you know, of a brewery. They're like, Oh, it's great that we have a local, you know, drink yeah. local and yeah. support local and yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Where do they come in at this point where we are, I think in the beer world, you know, very fragile yeah. right now, um, and looking to rebuild and looking to go forward. Where do you want the consumer support to be focused? Well, I know that I know that consumers have they're pulled in two different directions. Like if you want you you might want to support your local brewery and we saw a lot, I think in Buffalo, all all the local breweries would agree that when when we had to shut and go to phase 0 or phase 1 operations just doing curbside delivery, yeah. um or pickup um, we saw a groundswell of support that was, you know, um, that sustained us. And it was also incredibly heartwarming. And, you know, we, we feel a huge sense of gratitude for that. But when money gets tight, um, beer is one of those things that has a nice, comfortable range. You don't have to stop drinking beer because the money's tight, but you might buy a little less of the beer that costs a little more. Yeah. And you might be eyeing that 15 pack or that, you know. 24 rack of blue yeah <laughs> a little bit you yeah. know with a little bit more appeal as as your wallet gets lighter so i think you know beer broadly speaking is sort of Air recession quotes. proof yeah. but you know craft beer is a little bit more sensitive to it yeah. uh, because we just can't achieve the kind of price points that that a really large brewery can so i hope that consumers at least find you you, you might remember there was like sort of early as craft was growing where you had this kind of demographic that would go to a party with a 24 pack of blue, but also a six pack of Sam Adams. Right. They want to Pete's establish Wicked. themselves. Yeah. Oh, Pete's Wicked. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. They wanted to establish themselves as a, as a beer connoisseur and, and, and they wanted to drink a, a little bit better of a beer, but they also understood, Hey, you're bringing beer to a party. So you should probably bring something that everybody wants. And by the way, after you've had one or two Pete's Wicked, yeah. you probably don't mind so much what it is you're putting in your mouth because you're sure. feeling all right. Yeah. So I, 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 as long as that, that kind of customer is still there, we're going to be okay. If you go into Wegmans, I have to say Wegmans. Okay. Because Buffalo. Okay. If you go into Wegmans and you're picking up a six-pack of us with your 24-pack of, of, of quote-unquote them, whoever, um, then we're still we're going to be okay, and, and everybody, everybody will be okay um, until such time as you know, people can go back to maybe buying craft exclusively. Oh, my dog's here. Um, and agrees with me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the things that you sort of mentioned, though, of, of you know, the taproom model. And you had a blog post up on your website last week uh, or the week you know, before this, uh, this, this episode is going to air. Um, right now we're sitting in uh, New Jersey. It is almost mid-August. Uh, this is prime taproom outdoor drinking season. And uh, right now everybody's sort of worrying about the month to month to month to month. And you are closing your taproom. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, difficult decision. Um, but, you know, for us, it's about looking down the road a little bit yeah. and saying, you know, there's, there's, there's money that we, we should probably try to make while we can, but as safely as possible. And, oh, that feels icky. Yeah. To balance, you know, safety and, 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 and making, making money. Um, but, um, what, what we fear is that when it gets too cold, really, for us to realistically and serve in Buffalo, people, that's like mid-September. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we could invest in a whole bunch of. <laughs> Sorry, heaters. I'm just I'm just stereotyping no, I mean, at this I, point, well, but yeah, it's warmer than it used to be. Thanks, global warming. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I remember I remember Christmas as being snowy. And yeah, I haven't seen a snowy Christmas since I moved back in 2006. A lot of tropical shirts. I know. Yeah. Uh, but in any event, like, so for us, it's, it's really, I don't know that we can capture in, e, enough people once it starts to get cold to make it worthwhile. And if we put everybody indoors, that's, that's how you end up in the news because you became a COVID hotspot. Yeah, like, in I the just, bad way. Yeah. In the bad way. Right. So I, we're not usually the most cautious brewery. We actually tend to be the, the less cautious brewery, I guess, but this represents us growing up a little bit okay, and, and protecting our investment <laughs> and wanting to still be open in 2021. Um, so, you know, we can can beer all day and send it to the grocery stores and not have to worry about that kind of thing. And we can do that. So yeah. I think that's probably the right thing to do for now. But it's a long game at yeah. this point, right? Yeah. And I, I think everybody is sort of, not everybody, but there's a lot of breweries that are thinking short game right now of how much money can I make this summer before things get really bad. Yeah. You sort of flip that script a little bit of saying, okay, like, and that's probably a climate thing with you and, and, and a location thing with you. I mean, people in, you know, Buffalonians like to drink in the, in the heart of winter in the dead of winter. Oh, and sure. Yeah. So you're getting them ready for, for, you're getting you, your staff and them ready for that as opposed to just a couple more weeks of okay sales in the that's right i mean look you can still you can still buy our beer and drink it at home uh while you cook on the grill in december which buffalonians do and sure. also in january and also in february right? that's where so, the brown ale comes in yeah. correct so <laughs> so so i i'm not i mean i i think our beer is still available and we can we can put our marketing efforts a little bit more into that instead of trying to get people to come on down to our tap room we can let off the the, the pedal on that marketing effort and switch it over to hey we're available at all these places and you know you you can get us and bring us home and we're actually still going to use the the tap room for some private events here and there um, that will be you know limited in size for various reasons but we'll be able to control the 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 population let's say and feel a little bit more comfortable from a safety perspective um, and we're actually going to do a bunch of remodeling while while we've got it closed. So that when it reopens, it's a little bit more dynamic and a little bit more fun and a little bit refreshed. Because why not offer that while while you have the opportunity? I think using the downtime smartly is, I think, to anybody's benefit as a brewery owner right now. Of just, you know, be it education, be it retraining, be it, yeah. you know, refreshing and remodeling and going from there. Yeah. Um you are the co-author of <laughs> Buffalo Beer: The History of Brewing in the Nickel City. Uh, Michael Rizzo is your co-author yep. on this. Uh, you gave me a copy of this just before we sat down to record. I have not read this particular uh, beer history book from uh, the History Press. I've 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 read others. Um, you were the second brewery to open up in the postmodern age of uh, uh, in, in Buffalo. You cover, I imagine, given it's a, a history here, a lot of legacy breweries. Yep. Are you starting to think about your legacy? Are you starting to think about what your brewery will be when 50, 80 years from now, uh, historypress.com does <laughs> Buffalo Beer 2.0, the book? I wasn't, but I am now. Okay. <laughs> um, what do you want it to be? Gosh. Oh man! Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I thought we were just going to talk about your coins. Well, you're in all well, those old well, Welcome to the hot seat, motherfucker. Yeah. yeah Jeez. It's... <laughs> okay. Uh, Touche. Um. 
you served me barley wine. I'm sitting down in my backyard. My bed is like 25 <laughs> feet from here. Like, I'm, of fair, course, I'm going to just fair. throw a question at you that, uh, yeah. So I will say, I don't, I, I'm not, I have to make something up. Uh, so I'm going to do that. Uh, because, Please, by all means. That's all this show is. That's what I do. Right. Fair. Okay. Um, I mean, first of all, if anything, I would like, I would, I would like to have the leg. I mean, it's, it's not lost on me that, that we, that we opened up this brewery and, and nobody had really done that in 12 years. And then nobody had done that in like 25 years before that. That's when the last brewery closed in Buffalo was 1971. Yeah. So, or 72, but. So, you know, I, we are already kind of cited as kicking off, you know, the, the, the microbrewery scene. And everybody, you know, says, well, it, we know Flying Bison was there. But, like, after you guys, opening, 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 right? Within five years of us opening, we went from two breweries to, like, ten. Yeah. So, um, and I predicted that, actually. I mean, I, I assumed that that was happening. And, and quite honestly, I think we, we had good timing and good luck, um, you know, because if it wasn't us, it would have been someone else. Right. Um, in fact, I, we were aware of other people trying to get a nano brewery open at the same time that we were. So there was they even a bit of a race. No, they did not. But, you know, we, we felt a sense of competition. About sure. That. Yeah, sure. Um. So I don't I don't mind. In fact, I guess I hope that we are continue to be credited with kicking that off, because I will say that for what it's worth, a lot of the other breweries that opened up immediately after us came to us for questions and advice. And I just gave it freely because I knew we needed more other breweries. Yeah, I knew that our fortune was 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 going to be predicated on there being more. That's what didn't happen for Flying Bison. And, and, and did not serve them well. So I knew that we needed a thriving brewing scene. So there was absolutely no reason not to tell everybody everything I knew uh, about how to open a brewery or how not to open a brewery, as the case may be. Um, and, uh, and so I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that legacy. That, uh, that would be a good one. Let's, uh, well, we can put this interview in the time capsule and uh, the descendants of, uh, of you and Mike Rizzo, uh, when they write the, the follow-up book, they can just use your answer. Uh, just crib it completely from yeah, that, uh, yeah. That's perfect. That's uh, that's, perfect. that's the way that it works. That's what we do. Ethan, thanks for sitting down with me here in the backyard for uh, my first in-person podcast interview in gosh uh, months. And thanks for the barley wine. And uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for doing this. I appreciate the invitation. It was it was absolutely splendid. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. That's Ethan Cox, the president and main instigator at Community Beer Works in Buffalo, New York. Pick up a copy of his book that he co-authored with Michael Rizzo. It's called Buffalo Beer, The History of Beer in the Nickel City, published by History Press. My thanks to him for making the drive, sharing some great beers, and bringing some normalcy to this show. It was a fun oasis, but next week, we're back to the phone lines. Before we go... I'm going to remind you that this show is produced by Beer Edge. Check out BeerEdge.com and subscribe to the newsletter and also download the Beer Edge podcast hosted by Andy Crouch with new episodes every week. Also check out Steal This Beer and the BYO Nano podcast. And please don't forget to go on to Apple Podcasts or wherever you download and leave a review of this show. If you have questions, suggestions, or guests you'd like to hear, and you now know that that does work, you can email me at John Hall, it's J-O-H-N-H-O-L-L, at BeerEdge.com, or reach out on Twitter at John underscore Hall. Nate Schweber does the music, Jeff Quinn designed the logo, and new episodes of this show release every Wednesday. And that's when I'm back again to drink beer and to think beer, and I hope you'll join me then.